In the ancient charge on behaviour, it is stated, No private piques or quarrels must be brought within the door of the lodge, far less any quarrels about religion, or nations, or state policy, we being only, as Masons, of the universal religion. Note the phrase, we being only as Masons of the universal religion. Is it the answer to my query, and therefore makes any further discussion a mere beating of the air? Another word for universal is Catholic, and there are religions claiming to be that. If Masonry is a religion, is it then among one of the world's religions? If so, what is its relation to them? Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. Section 1. Points of Agreement A. All the great religions of the world have the externals of religion. They have altars, sacred books, prayer is offered, and reverent actions are demanded from their adherents. So too has masonry. In every degree there is an altar. The sacred book is prominently displayed and frequently quoted. Prayer is offered, and... When the name of God is mentioned, an attitude of reverence is demanded of the brethren. B. In all religions, whether they be of the lowest or the more advanced, standards of character are set forth to be aimed at by their followers. For example, Pythagorean communities enunciate, Purity of the soul is the only divine service, or God has no place on earth more akin to his nature than the pure soul. It is a far cry from Pythagoras to the indigenous Australian, but the indigenous Australian too has a standard of character placed before him after his initiation. For example, he must show consideration towards the aged, the sick and the infirm. Ceremonies of initiation, wherever they may be, are regarded as of the greatest importance, and through them social ties of tribal kinship gain coherence and strength. Masonry also has a standard of character for its members after initiation. I quote from our ancient charges. Charge 2. A Mason is to be a peaceable subject to the civil powers wherever he resides or works, and is never to be concerned in plots or conspiracies against the peace and welfare of the nation. Craftsmen are bound by a peculiar tie to promote peace, cultivate harmony, and live in concord and brotherly love. Charge 5. All Masons shall work honestly on working days, that they may live creditably on holy days, and the time appointed by the law of the land or confirmed by custom shall be observed. Charge 6. A Mason is not to use any unbecoming language upon any pretext whatever, but to pay due reverence to his master, wardens and fellows, and put them to worship. Masons may enjoy themselves with innocent mirth, treating one another according to ability, but avoiding all excess, or forcing any brother to eat or drink beyond his inclination. Masons are to salute one another in a courteous manner. Masons are to act as becomes a moral and wise man. Masons must consult their health, and by not continuing too late or too long from home after lodge hours are past, and by avoiding of gluttony or drunkenness that their families be not neglected or injured, nor they disabled from working. Masons are to cultivate brotherly love, 
the foundation and copestone, the cement and the glory of this ancient fraternity, avoiding all wrangling and quarrelling, all slander and backbiting, not permitting others to slander any honest brother, but defending his character and doing him all good offices, as far as is consistent with honour and safety, and no further. C. Death is an element of universal experience. The question, if a man die, shall he live again, is as old as the book of Job, but the affirmative answer is much older. The earliest human remains in Europe imply some provision for the dead, and it did not occur to the peoples of the lower cultures all over the world to doubt the reality of some kind of continued existence. Like all religions, Masonry insists on a belief in a life after death. Ritual concerning the dead is common to all religions. In the funeral rites of a Chinese family, a paper house with paper furniture and large quantities of paper money may be buried for the endowment of a departed member in the next life. On the Gold Coast in the last century, an observer saw fine clothes and gold buried with the chief, and a flask of rum and tobacco ready to his hand. Nowadays, when a priest is buried, his body is clothed in his priestly vestments. When a mason is interred, his regalia, or part of it, is buried with him. The outward act is retained, but not its implications. Section 2 I have stated the above somewhat at length, not only to show that Masonry has much in common with the religions of the world, but in order to ask a number of questions arising from it. Do the externals of religion constitute a religion? Is belief, even a belief in God and in a life after death, religion? Is morality religion and the whole duty of man and the whole service of God? In short, what is religion, and what is the relation between religion and morality? Section 3 I am taking no single religion as standard for the whole of the human race, nor am I now concerned with what are true and what are false religions. Dr. Johnson might declare that there are two subjects of curiosity, the Christian world and the Mohammedan world, all the rest may be considered as barbarians. Workers of past generations may assert that savages had no religion because they had no father in heaven and no everlasting hell. These attitudes are now abandoned and everywhere regarded as unscientific. In the 17th century, an Oxford scholar, Edward Herbert, the brother of holy George Herbert, revolting against the doctrine that all the world outside the pale of the church was doomed to eternal damnation, examined the recorded facts about religion among the Greeks and Romans, the Carthaginians and Arabs, the Phrygians, the Persians and Assyrians. And the conclusions he came to were that the principles of religion were five. One, that there is one supreme God. Two, that he ought to be worshipped. Three, that virtue and piety are the chief parts of divine worship. Four, that we ought to feel sorry for our sins and repent them. And five, that divine goodness doth dispense rewards and punishment both in this life and after it. He held that these truths had been implanted by the Creator in the minds of man, and their subsequent corruption produced the idolatry of antiquity. Two hundred years later, i.e. in the middle of the 19th century, through the efforts of Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace, this theory that religion consisted of a body of doctrines which must be true or false, reached by natural reflection or imparted by supernatural revelation, was abandoned, and the conviction became general that, Whatever may be the occasional instances of degeneration or decline, the general movements of human things advance from the cruder 
and less complex to the more refined and developed. Religion was seen to be one phase of human culture, expressing man's attitude to the powers around him and the events of life. Theologies may be many, but religion is one. A common element or purpose may be traced through all. Of necessity, religion expresses itself in acts, but these acts are important, not simply as acts that can be recorded and observed, but because of the world of thought and feeling which lie behind them. Here are the bases of religion, and from them development takes place. A. Thought In the performance of his acts, the worshipper's interest is aroused. At first this may be vague and indefinite, but thought begins, and as it advances, it may express itself through him and prayer, through myth, history, and prophecy. A sacred literature begins to be created, and the utterances of poet, sage, lawgiver, and seer are collected. Hence the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Vedic hymns, the immense literature of Brahmanism, early and later Buddhism and Hinduism, the compositions of the Persian prophet Zarathustra, the Old and the New Testaments, and the Koran. B. Feeling Mr. Ward Fowler gives the primitive meaning of religion as the feeling of awe, anxiety, doubt, or fear, which is aroused in the mind by something that cannot be explained by man's experience, or by the natural course of cause and effect, and which is therefore referred to the supernatural. Another recent definition states that religion is a collection of beliefs, practices, or personal attitude concerning reality, personal or impersonal, unique, multiple, or collective, but in some way supreme, upon which man feels himself somehow or other dependent, and with whom he desires to enter into relation. In some cases, this belief may be so indefinite that religion and superstition overlap. But whether it be twisted into degraded forms, or whether it assume the loftiest spirituality, it will be found that wonder, awe, and reverence are inherent in them all. In its highest form, this results in a response to the divine self-revelation and a life of loving fellowship with God. Section 4. How does masonry measure up to this? 1. It possesses no formal creed. Beyond expressing a belief in God and defining him as the glorious architect of heaven and earth, and his character under certain names, or in one sublime word, masonry has no statement of religious belief. 2. Though it may express itself sometimes in hymn and prayer, masonry has no sacred literature of its own. It makes use of the literature of the world religions. 3. A mason acknowledges his dependence upon God and places his trust in him. In all times of difficulty and danger, in whom do you put your trust? In God. But in any of the ceremonies through which he passes, does a mason feel he is entering into relation with God and desires fellowship with him? Does he at any time express the desire to do so? I think not. In certain parts of the 18th degree, in one ceremony of the Order of Knights Templar, and of the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre of St. John the Evangelist, all Christian degrees, there is a near approach to worship as expressed in wonder, awe, and reverence. But it is accidental. These degrees lack just that essential of religion, viz. a conscious dependence on and a loving fellowship with God. In all Masonic ceremonies, the emphasis is laid upon man's relation with man, not man's relation with God. Section 5 At the beginning of a Mason's career, 
he is told that masonry is a peculiar system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols, and that the grand principles upon which the order is founded are brotherly love, relief, and truth. Is morality, then, the whole duty of man and the whole service of God? What is the relation between religion and morality? We know that religion expresses itself in sacrifice and devotion, and in a certain kind of conduct which we call morality, but the beginnings of morality can no more be discovered historically than the beginnings of religion. The foundations of morality lies in a social usage. When any custom is established with sufficient strength to serve as a rule demanding observance, so that its breach evokes some feeling, the seed of morals is germinating. No group, however small, no society, however crude, can cohere without such customs. These customs become strengthened by repetition, and thereby gain the power of authority, so that ultimately, impulses and private interest must be subordinated to a rule, and conformed to a standard of behaviour. But, though it is possible that religion and morality may not have started hand in hand, and their alliance disbanded, and morality claimed total independence, as, for example, in Russia today, yet, whatever their origin, generally, religion and morality have marched together, and religion has supplied the principle on which law is regulated and morality decided. The extreme is reached when religion becomes the all-powerful element, and people, like the Hindus, eat religiously, drink religiously, bathe religiously, dress religiously, and even sin religiously. The following quotation from Dr. Otley, I think, puts the case plainly. The end of religion is that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. But religion is something wider and deeper than morality, the conformity of human life to divine law. It lies beyond morality as its source and motive power. With that, masonry agrees, for all workings in all lodges is done under a symbol denoting the Most High, and, before a candidate can learn of the peculiar system of morality of masonry, he must first state his belief in God. Section 6 So then, to my question. Is masonry a universal religion? The word universal has many meanings. As applied to masonry, it might have the Catholic sense of quod semper, quod ubique, et quod omnibus. But I think the claim of masonry to be universal lies in fact, that though it is not necessary for all people, indeed, by its constitution it eliminates half the people of the world, it is to be found all over the world. And I think I have made it clear that masonry is not a religion with its fundamental idea of fellowship with God. It inclines strongly towards humanism, the religion of humanity, but, by its reliance upon the Most High, it is more than humanism. Its own description of itself is best. A peculiar system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols, with the emphasis that divine aid is necessary to carry out its principles. So mote it be.